Uinta Basin Special Events Coverage on VTV6 and Strata Web View is made possible by Century 21 Parker Real Estate Professionals, The Porch Southern Cuisine, Uinta Basin Healthcare, and Wind River Wireless. Thank you for being here. I appreciate your attendance. I, I want to, um, right to start, give the Basin Art Council a big round of applause for putting this lecture series on. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> it's fun to see a group take so much pride and ownership in the, in the great city that we live in, with, in Roosevelt City, have the Basin Arts group. Um, I worked with them eight years when I was on city council, and I can tell you that's a group that's not afraid to, to get out and make things happen. And sometimes we'd want to slow them down or they'd want to, um, we'd want to maybe go a different direction and they let us know that they were going to make it happen and, and you know what they did and I appreciate everything they've done and, and they made a big difference to this community. We're really excited tonight to have VTV here um, recording this as well and if you want to watch it again or have people that couldn't make it, they can go on the, the internet and, and see the recording there so we'd like to, to remind everybody of that and again we thank them for their sponsorship. We'd also like to thank Wind River. Um, for being a sponsor of the, the Centennial program as well. Upper, Upper Country Catering, I don't know if everybody knows Upper Country, they've taken over the Aggie Snack Bar, um, Aggie Station. Um, they provided the treats for us this evening, so when we're done, um, we'll be able to enjoy the, the um, treats from Upper Country. If you haven't had an opportunity to step in and eat lunch there, do so. I've, I've eaten there several times, it's pretty good, so we'd just like to throw a pitch out there for, for them. The council also wanted me to mention April 15th, is that right, is the next lecture series. It'll be he held right here. Okay, so that's April 15th, and uh, they're still trying to get a commitment for the speaker, um, but it'll be on the history of medicine in the Uinta Basin, so that'll be a, a good one to attend as, as well. It's my opportunity um, and my sincere privilege to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Um, if I can find the notes that he gave me. There it is. Um, Mark Dennis. I can tell you Mark is, has been a, a real treat for the people in the Uinta Basin, whether it's been working closely with Utah State University, whether it's UBATC. When you talk about education in the Uinta Basin, you can't talk about it without several names mentioned, one of those being Mark, Mark Dennis and his folks. I'd like you to first of all introduce his, his folks, Dan and Joyce. Just to, you don't need to stand up, but turn around and, and wave. I think everybody knows them. <laughs> been great community members throughout many years and several of us are just enjoying the benefits and the hard work that they put in and so I would personally like to thank both Joyce and Dan for all the hard work that they've they put into education and, and many other things but it, it's nice we're celebrating education um, the education aspect that you've had here in the Uinta Basin so we're, we're glad that you can be here with us tonight and, and Dan we're excited to hear from you as well. Um, I think everybody knows Mark, probably not a person in the room that doesn't know Mark and Rhonda um, took a little bit of arm twisting to get Mark to do this, but we twisted hard enough that he committed to, to come give us a little bit of, of history um, of education in the Uinta Basin. Mark and Rhonda um, have two sons, and I, most of us know Nick and, and, and Brandon. Um, Mark graduated from Union High School in 1973, went on to Utah State University, got his undergraduate in 1979, and then did his graduate work in veterinary science from CSU in 1983. Immediately after graduating, is that right, Mark? You come back to the basin to go to work with his, with his father in the veterinary clinic, and since then has done a lot of good for education here in the Uinta Basin. So with that said, we'd like to turn the time over to Mark, and again, Mark, thank you for your efforts in putting all this together. Uh, some of you might be wondering, why I am giving a lecture on education <laughs> in Roosevelt for the centennial celebration. And I have to confess, I've asked myself that same question. Uh, there are others whom I greatly respect, uh, principals, superintendents, presidents of colleges, faculty members that would probably be more adept at speaking on the actual educational issues um, I look at myself somewhat as a bystander to what's happened in education here in the basin. And so I've, I was pondering from what vantage point 
I should speak tonight and uh, kind of resign myself to the fact that the only advantage point I have to speak from is my own. So that's the one you're going to hear. <laughs> um, <in the clears throat> I'm going to introduce myself to the audience and speak about my personal observations with respect to the progression of education in our fair city. And then in the end, maybe explore with you what may be in the future if we have time. This is a picture of my home where I was born er, <clears throat> and raised. Uh, I was born in 1955. That was 10 years after the end of the Second World War. And so I and my classmates are the classic baby boom generation. Uh, with respect to education, I believe it <clears throat> happens not only inside the classroom, but outside the classroom as well. And I was privileged to begin my education um, at the side of my wonderful parents. I think they say that children learn about half of what they're going to learn in the first five years of their life. I'm not sure I didn't look up the statistic on that. I'll have to look that up better. But Anyway, I have fond memories of my time spent on what we called the farm. My father's parents lived on a farm, which was out on the South Mighton Bench. Um, today, literally hundreds of oil field workers zoom past that very property on their way out to the South Mighton oil field. The uh, landscape has changed quite a bit. Um, I remember large shade trees, chicken coops, pigs, horses, bossy the milk cow, a large garden, apple and apricot orchards, raspberries, granaries, haystacks complete with Jackson Fork Derrick, and grandparents who worked hard. Um, I learned that butter came from cream that was churned had the privilege of churning it once in a while. I can still smell the smell of fresh bread or rolls coming out of a wood-burning stove oven. Suffice it to say, I gained an appreciation for where food came from and it doesn't always originate in a store. <clears throat> because we're the baby boom generation, there was not room at the Roosevelt Elementary School for all of the children starting kindergarten in 1960. Consequently, a small group of children were sent to the Toyok building for kindergarten. I'm gonna point that out, that's the building. This is the Toyak building right there. This is what it looks like today. <laughs> um, I don't remember much about kindergarten, except that we learned, took naps, and had milk and snacks every day. Because the Toyak building was next to the old Roosevelt High School, where today's bus garage is located across the street from the hospital, a couple of children were given the task of retrieving said milk and crackers from the lunchroom. I remember being scolded for tardiness one day and going to retrieve the snacks because I and my female companion were distracted by a dance that was going on in the gymnasium of that old high school. Remember, it was the 1960s. Teenagers were learning a whole new way to dance. <laughs> my teacher that year, and again in the third grade, was Jean Eldridge. It wasn't until later in life that I gained a better appreciation for that Toyak chapter building. It was built mostly by ag students under the direction of Mr. Walter C. Atwood. In fact, this man had a tremendous influence on one particular student who probably would not have gone away to college without his encouragement. And that student is my father, Daniel S. Dennis. My dad told me a bit about that first high school that stood atop the hill next to where the Villa Care Center is today. It was opened in 1919 and it had a gym, chemistry lab, and a shop on the lower floor. It was a three-story building. The auditorium was over the gym, as well as some classrooms on the main floor. And then more classrooms were on the top floor. He would have attended that high school, I think, right from about 1937 to 1939. <clears throat> 
I can remember the gym because it was that very gym I was looking down into the day I was distracted getting the milk and crackers. I think these must have been junior high school students that were dancing because Union High School was opened in 1951 and I don't think that old junior high school, that the junior high school that I attended had been built yet. Whoop. I just wanted to highlight this old junior high. This is the only picture I have of it. If you'll notice this sign right up here, I have it on good authority that that sign was donated by the class of 1970. Right, Margaret? It was. <laughs> <laughs> I remember walking to, the, to kindergarten to that Toyak chapter building, the crossing fields and a small ditch. In fact, there were boards over that. I talked to Tim McDonald today, and he remembered the same thing. He was also a classmate of mine. Um, interestingly enough, my house is just four blocks uh, west, <coughs> east of, of these, this uh, Toyak building and about six blocks north of the old elementary school. So most of my beginning, I walked to school. I have the privilege of not having to ride on a bus. And there are probably a lot of you in here that wish you would have had that privilege as well. <laughs> anyway. Um, where the 2nd 11th LDS Chapel sits, the dialysis center. I think I've got a picture. This is the, the hospital, the clinics. All of that whole area was just fenced uh, fields, and there was a small ditch running through the top of it that we had to jump over as we were headed down that dirt path. Um, since I'm 58 years of age, there were 42 years of educational history that occurred in Roosevelt before my time. And I appreciate Stephanie Carter. She's helped me research some of the early ed uh, education that took place in, in that era. I also read a very good article by uh, Professor John D. Barton uh, entitled A History of Utah State's University's Regional Campuses and Distance Education. I just want to point out that throughout the rest of this uh, presentation, the slideshows, anything that has to do with U Utah State University, uh, I've kind of had a blue heading, and then anything to do with the UBATC, the technical college, has a green heading. Um, just interesting to note that uh, this is actually before the 100-year celebration, but it makes, uh, it was interesting to me that in 1888, March 8th, a bill was passed by the legislature uh, cre to create the Utah Agricultural College, as it was designated, and it was Utah's land-grant institution. This would have a tremendous impact on our city, as you'll soon learn. This is a picture of the first schools in Roosevelt. We've come a long way, baby. <laughs> <laughs> This is a few of the older pictures that came out of a book, but uh, some of the first schools here in Duchesne County. I won't take too much time on that. But Here was a clipping that Stephanie got, and I thought it was interesting. I wanted to show this article. It was an article from the paper about a Teachers Institute meeting held in November of 1919. The superintendent of schools was a man by the name of J.A. Washburn. In this article, it says that the teachers were assembled at Roosevelt Hall and a prayer was offered. Superintendent Washburn gave a few introductory remarks, followed by Superintendent Cummings, who gave a thought for teachers. He said in part that it would be well to have some sort of a devotional exercise of a moral nature in every school, passages of scripture, hymns, these things to be included for the development of character some great moral truth for the uplifting of mankind in order to form the character of the pupil, teaching them the way to lead a clean life. <laughs> it's kind of about the same way our school board meetings go now, isn't it? <laughs> Starting in uh, 1923, the Utah Agricultural College instructors made a trip out here. They traveled to Fort Duchesne to participate in the first 
Uinta Basin Industrial Convention, affectionately known by the rest of us as the UBIC. I'm kind of wondering if Utah State University would like to participate in the financing of the current UBIC. I don't know. We'll <laughs> contact the College of Logan. Anyway, after some poor harvests and a financial downturn, the Uinta Basin residents were really despondent over their future prospects. So local leaders from Uinta and Duchesne counties and the Ute tribe teamed with the professional Aggie support came up with the idea of a celebration or a convention of a sort to raise the spirits and teach new and improved agricultural methods, finance, etc., to the region's farmers. As the UBIC grew from that dawning, many notable speakers came to Fort Duchesne, including Utah Governor Henry Blood and Utah State Agricultural College uh, President E.G. Peterson. Uh, it's interesting that in 1907, after the Utah Agricultural College had been created, supporters from the University of Utah, including several state legislators, fearing that the U UCAT, UAC's growth was taking students from U, U of U, struck an agreement to strictly limit the curricula of the Agricultural College to agriculture, domestic science, and mechanic arts. And that ban was finally lifted in 1929. So that was uh, several years that that ban was on. Now I'm going to go back a little bit to the early days of the basin. Um, my father reflected a little bit on the early days of the Una Basin, and he, he said this, I'll quote, Communities were established about every eight or ten miles apart where people could ride a horse or a wagon or a buggy or walk to school, to church, etc. Thus, Roosevelt was surrounded by Myton, Hartford, Ioka, Neola, Bennett, and Fort Duchesne. Some of those names are still familiar, but some of them aren't. I don't think they had a little red schoolhouse like they had on the plains. Grade schools, as they were called, probably started in homes, churches, or other buildings by the late teens and the early 20s. After World War I, schools were uh, starting to be established. There was a brick elementary school in Mighton and one in Neola. Later, the Roosevelt Elementary School was built. It had a gym and an auditorium combined and was a two-story building. And I couldn't find a picture of the old Roosevelt Elementary. I wish we could have had one for this. Uh, so the next best thing was just to take a picture of where it used to be, <laughs> which was where our current uh, city building and Crossroads Senior, Citizen, Senior Center is located. Now that is the building where I spent six years of my early life. Yes, six years. We didn't have middle schools in those days, so you had to go to the same school for six years. <laughs> but it was great. As early as 1940, uh, there was an attempt to secure a junior college in Roosevelt that narrowly missed approval by the state legislature. So the, the idea of a junior college had started uh, quite a bit further back than what I had remembered. And so in the research here, it's been kind of interesting to know that. We're going to come back to that. But uh, for now, we need to go to this. <laughs> it was in 19, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there came a time when that old Roosevelt High School that was on the hill needed to be torn down and replaced. And uh, well, it wasn't replaced at that time, as I said. I, I was still seeing it in 1960, but uh, about 1951, Union High School was built. It was located on the county line between Duchesne County and Uinta County, hence the name Union. Here are some of the students that were registering for classes at the new Union High School. Here's a photograph of one of the first sweetheart dances. Any here in the audience at that one? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Student enrollment figures for high schools are shown here. Uh, Roosevelt High School enrollments were really unknown from about 1913 to 1920, and then in 1921, 
it said that there were 92 students en enrolled. By the next year, they had skyrocketed to 130. This just kind of gives uh, some of the enrollment figures at the high school here in Roosevelt. While the student numbers grew slowly at first, there were about 441 when I graduated in 1973. The number of students has grown quickly over the last several decades, and currently there are 913 students at Union High School. It's been over 60 years since its construction, and it is time for a new high school. <laughs> I see a lot of people. <laughs> in 1957, I'm kind of jumping all over here, and I apologize, but that's the way this presentation goes. I'm, uh, president, under uh, President Darrell Chase's watch at the president of Utah State, uh, well, it would have a agricultural college, the governor of Utah signed an act of the state legislature changing Utah State's name from Agriculture College to University. And that will have tremendous impact on us, as you can see later. Uh, in the late 1958, that was three years after he helped deliver me from my mother's womb, a committee headed by Dr. R. V. Larson spent a great deal of time studying, planning, researching, and then drafting a proposal that would be presented to the legislature that was to be seated in January of 1959. When the legislature convened, Representative Benny Schmidt of Roosevelt was named to the important education committee in the House. On January 20th, 1959, the bill for the junior college, which proposed construction of a minimal campus buildings to be completed by 1962 was submitted by Representative Schmidt, raising favorable comments by House members. But the bill to create a junior college, <clears throat> while, but while the bill to create a junior college passed there, there was no funding allocated for it. Uh, by the 1960s, which, you know, a few years later, there are many people who had moved to the basin from outside of the area who had attended college elsewhere and had relocated here for work. The dream of having a higher education in the basin was renewed again. I guess you could call the dream of higher education here was sparked by many forward-looking leaders who had gone to college elsewhere and moved to the basin. Among those men were Alva Snow, Calvin Koalas, Hollis Hollinger, John Gale, Keith Birdquist, Ted Kappen and Claire Nashby, and I'm probably missing a whole bunch of others. But it wasn't hard to see what higher education uh, institution had done for Logan, for St. George, Ephraim, Price, Cedar City, and Manti. These men could see the financial drain from the basin with students expending thousands of dollars for housing, transportation, and tuition. With basin tax dollars supporting other areas, they compared the small number of high school graduates going to college compared with the schools closer to colleges. Out here in the basin, the, that number was 25% uh, uh, of the high school graduates that would go on to college at all. And that was compared to about 80%, I think, in the rest of the state. I'm not exactly sure what the numbers are today, uh, but I think it's much greater than that if you consider all of our high school students who go on concurrent enrollment and go to the UBATC, it's pretty high. But we need to improve it still. Anyway, the feeling was that the higher education here in the basin would entice the Native Americans and other students to go to college. Even though a junior college was authorized in Roosevelt, there was no funding. That's your cue, Dad. <laughs> I, uh, I asked my dad to write some of this, and I tried to tape it, and uh, he said, don't you think it would be better coming from the horse's mouth? <laughs> he told me he has four legs, so he's a horse. <laughs> anyway, he's going to kind of tell you the story of what really happened in the legislature, so I'll turn the time to him now.
Ladies and gentlemen, I <clears throat> really feel like a horse. I got four legs now. <clears throat> but uh, as I thought about this celebration of 100 years here in Roosevelt, I thought back to 90 and a half years ago. I was born in a little log house somewhere in that block between the city building and Main Street. So it makes me feel kind of ancient <laughs> to think I've been here 90 of those years. <laughs> well, after I was elected to the legislature, I came home and, well, uh, before I went to the legislature, there was a community group that called me in and they wanted to talk to me about this junior college thing. And, and uh, when it was all over, they kind of had placed a burden on my shoulders to do something about the junior college. And uh, so I went out there kind of fat, dumb, and happy and don't know where to start. But when I got there, I found out that <clears throat> junior colleges were uh, controlled by the State Board of Education. And uh, the bigger universities, Utah State and U University of Utah, and even Weber, they fought their own battles in the legislature to get their funds. And, uh, and then the junior colleges were kind of handled by the state board. And uh, A lot of things haven't changed, have they? <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, there was a real battle going on between uh, the State Board of Education people and higher education people about where the governance ought to be for higher education. And in the legislative session before I was there, they <coughs> established the Coordinating Council on, on Higher Education. And uh, when I checked with them about uh, junior college, uh, their criteria was 400 students minimum to start. Well, if that was the criteria that started in Utah, we wouldn't have had any of the colleges because they all started with a lot less students than that. So I kind of give up on them. I went down to Ted Bell, who was the State Board of Education superintendent, and I asked him uh, how much would it cost to operate a junior college. I was kind of at a loss. We didn't have a building. We didn't have any land. We didn't have anything out here to, to, to teach a uh, class in, so I was, I was kind of lost. But anyway, Ted Bell looked at some figures he had, and, and he came up with a, without building maintenance, he said, and administration is probably around $280,000. But he said, I've got $100,000 in federal funds for a vocational building out there. And I wanted it union. And he said, I've, I've tried to get the, the, the Una County and Duchesne County to come together and come up with the matching funds for that $100,000. And Una County won't come up with a penny. And I thought about it in a minute, and I said, <clears throat> well, if Duchesne County come up with the money, would you still allocate it out there? He said, I sure would. And so that's where the vocational uh, program of, of the Uinta Basin started, the post-secondary. <clears throat> well, we had some secretaries and so forth to uh, uh, write up the bills and so I had them start on a bill to to fund the, the junior college at Roosevelt for 280,000 and and I came home uh, after that first week and and I met with this committee again and uh, boy they were thrilled uh, to think what we'd done we they were thrilled especially about the vocational uh, possibilities and uh, and they wanted a bill introduced. And so that was the, the burden that was placed on me, and it was a mandate. Well, from that time forward, 
we had about one to three car loads of, of these community people who would go out to the legislature and they would be up and down the halls buttonholing anybody they could to, to uh, tell them about what we needed here in the basin. And uh, we got uh, Bob Clyde, who was our senator from Heber on board, and, <clears throat> and uh, then the committee here started to uh, uh, work on getting the, uh, maybe a place to teach the classes. We thought if we got the vocational building, we could teach some there, and uh, maybe we could teach them in the high school or the grade school or wherever. And so they got to work on the school board, and, and then they worked on the, both the school board and the county commission to get the, the $100,000 for the, for the vocational. Well, the story of the bill through the legislature is kind of a book in itself, but I'll try to be as brief as I can. Uh, I might say that uh, I was told that I'd become, in the, I'd become the laughing stock of the legislature and, and that the bill would never pass, and I was foolish to introduce it and, and all these things, and I just felt like I still had a mandate. So I went ahead and had them produce a, a good, uh, write up the bill, and then all the bills go first to uh, the Rules Committee. And the Rules Committee assigns them out to the various other committees of the legislature for their, for their uh, <coughs> presentation there. And uh, in that Rules Committee, there was a motion made to table the bill because it was a waste of legislative time. And uh, the first miracle was that that was defeated. And the second miracle was that the higher education and education committees were kind of heavily loaded. And so they assigned this bill to, to another education and to another committee. I can't remember. I thought it was the Ag, Ag Committee, but I'm not sure. Now, 45 years, a long time to remember. But <clears throat> at any rate, uh, if they'd assigned it to higher ed or, or the other one, it would have immediately been killed. And so you see there was another miracle. <clears throat> well, it was finally voted out to the House of the Floor and went to that committee and, and uh, I presented it there and the, uh, one of the uh, older members of the legislature uh, said, we ought to round that out to 300,000. He made a motion and it passed just like that. So that increased the amount of money for me and I was pretty pleased about that. I presented all my uh, things about what we needed here and what we could do with it and, and it, it passed that and it came out on the floor, but it was kind of held up because of the Rules Committee and a few things, and so it was behind an awful lot of other bills. And uh, it didn't come really up on the floor of the House until uh, kind of late in the session. And uh, I had the opportunity to, to uh, present the bill there in the legislature. And uh, I was pretty well liked in the legislature. I don't know for sure why. I learned all the names, first names of the senators and the House members within the first two weeks and, and people seemed to really like me and so when the bill came to the floor I pleaded my case and, and uh, did the best I could and, and <clears throat> we voted on the bill and it just passed with a few votes. And a lot of the legislators came up to me and said, well, I just couldn't vote against you. I just didn't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> because I know it's going to die in the Senate. So that was another, another miracle. <clears throat> well, after it passed the House, I was privileged to present it in the Senate. Uh, no one can speak in the House or the Senate except senators and, and members of the House. 
So the, the Senate has to go into what's called committee as a whole. And <clears throat> so they voted to go into that and let me present the bill. And, and uh, I went through all my uh, information and, and uh, they uh, accepted it. And, and I kind of stepped out and, and they went back into the the uh, regular session of the, le of the Senate, and, and uh, they passed it on first reading. Well, the Senate has a program where they read it, where they, they go over the bill three times, first, second, and third reading. And uh, so I went back to the House and, and <clears throat> right after I left, somebody in the Senate made a motion to amend the bill with some gram gr grammatical uh, changes, just two, three words, I think it was. And uh, <clears throat> so they made that amendment and sent it back to the House where it should have died in the first place, they said. And uh, so I went back over to the House and it was the last day and it never did come up. And whenever one house passes a bill and it's sent to the other, that takes precedence. And I couldn't figure out why that bill didn't come up. I went over to Bob Clyde. I said, hey, didn't that bill ever go from the Senate over there? He says, oh, yes. I said, it's never come up. Boy, he jumped out of his seat and come over to the house. He went up there to the Speaker of the house and wanted to know what the trouble was. The speaker reached into his desk and pulled out his drawer, and there was my bill. He was going to leave it there in that drawer and let it die. Bob Clyde read him the right act right there. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's against the rules, and if you don't bring that bill up, I'll report you to the media and to the, to the uh, legislature, and you'll be done here. And uh, so the speaker brought the bill up, and I uh, had the opportunity to accept the, the uh, amendments on it. That was fine with me. It didn't hurt anything. And uh, so then it had to be voted on again by the House. And I didn't speak that very, very long on it that time. I just appealed to them. and. Uh, Lo and behold, when we voted on it, it passed by one vote <laughs> because they said the government was going to veto it. <clears throat> <laughs> well, the next step was the governor. And Bob Clyde, I think, was called in on that. And he and the governor met together, and, and uh, they decided that uh, only thing they could do was to send the funds up to Utah State uh, Extension Service and have them come out here and teach some classes. And, and the governor felt like that it wouldn't be anything like college. And, and uh, he was pretty confident that it would die a natural death after the first year. Well, USU had a Mr. Del Purnell, Dr. Del Purnell, who came here to administer this uh, first uh, bill and uh, first uh, effort and uh, failure was just not in Dell's uh, vocabulary. He just, that was not hit part of him ever. And so he began to register people and there was people almost as old as I am now and from there on down to high school graduates that registered for classes. and. And so the college began to send down professors, and we had a, they used to fly them down here in a little old airplane, and, and uh, Dr. Purnell decided he was going to recruit a couple of three of the teachers here who had master's degrees, I think, and, and have them teach English and math at least. And, and uh, so that's where the first uh, uh, professors from here came from, and that's where concurrent in, uh, enrollment first came about in the state of Utah was those two student or those two teachers that he he converted or he recruited to teach in this in this college 
Well, I was assigned to the, to the uh, Higher Education Committee in the legislature in my first session, and, and I stayed there all of the rest of the 12 years that I was there. And uh, I was able to kind of see to the funding uh, together with uh, uh, Alva Snow. I don't remember the year he was appointed to the Institutional Council at Utah State University. I'll bring that up later. But it was wonderful to have his help and mine to see that the funding continued for those 12 years and the rest is history. I really appreciate Utah State and all that they've done and, and for the privilege I've had and, and thank you folks for letting me come here and say that to you. Well, as he said, the rest is history, and uh, I'm going to go over a little bit of that history. Uh, it's quite interesting uh, that not only did the beginnings of Utah State University or Unibasin campus start at this, that same time in 1967, but um, the vocational center started at, at the same time. Uh, this says it was started in 1968, so those classes, even though the bill was passed and the funding was passed in 67, it was 68 before. Uh, so I'm going to speak now and I'll go back and forth between uh, U Utah State and also the Vocational Center. It's kind of interesting that this bill, this original $300,000, was used to kind of jumpstart both programs. I, I hadn't realized that for, for uh, quite a long time. Uh, George Thatcher was hired uh, as the first uh, vocational center director uh, and uh, I happen to know him and his family. You know when you look at George Thatcher there, doesn't he look like someone just right out of the Son of Blubber movie? <laughs> He was the right man for the job. <laughs> so using the money that was appropriated for vocational education, a vocational agricultural building was built next to Union High School in 1968. And this is a slide showing that there was George and T.H. Bell uh, had come out um, to at the dedication. This is just a picture of what was the first building built. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> there were uh, vocational or uh, technical training centers associated with high schools throughout the rest of the state. But as far as any state funded vocational center, this was the very first one that occurred in the state of Utah. The first year at the Vocational Center, student enrollments were high, including 35 of the Native American descent, as you can see. Bob, do we have a few more than that right now? <laughs> a few more. But that was amazing to me. When you think about it, you know, not just half a dozen students, uh, but over 200 students from Duchesne High School and 155 from Uinta County started in secondary education the very first year. And then there were 118 adult students and they were taught evening classes and such things, eight, eight different areas and that was at that, ver that first building in drafting, woods, business, electronics, commercial art, welding, agricultural mechanics. USU was likewise growing, and in 1969, the first off-campus instructor, meaning the first off-campus off of Logan's campus, was hired. Bruce Goodrich was hired as a half-time position to teach math. In addition to teaching, he was um, also the athletic director and coached the basketball team. 
I thought to myself, they were trying everything to recruit people back in those days. The same thing happened later, though, when they tried to do a rodeo team, and that's how we got Dave Wollstonehume here. <laughs> they had elected student body officers. I think my sister, LaDon, was one of those, but... Uh, Lynn, Th Lynn Truman, Theron Schaefermeyer, some of the others, maybe you'll... Yeah. Another girl. Anyway, uh, these student body officers, their task was to go around to all the local high schools, go up to Tabiona, to Duchesne, and go to Bernal and just try to tout the advantages of staying here and going to college. You know, it's kind of hard to do that when there wasn't a building, but they were, uh, they were good at it. Well, it, it did work for me. I, I didn't play basketball, but uh, Dr. Goodrich uh, did try to teach me some pre-calculus and calculus while I was in high school and is uh, going to uh, what they called concurrent enrollment at that time. Let's go back over to the vocational center. The second year of the vocational center was even better than the first. If you look at that, more students began to enroll for the evening classes. We're up to 255 adult students the second year. Um, <clears throat> after George Thatcher left in 1970, Garth Sorensen took the helm until 1972 and continued later after that to teach automatic, automotive classes for many years. Most of us in here know Garth. By the third year, there were 360 adult students. And to me, that's just fantastic. It's unbelievable that in three short years, we were growing that quickly. Uh, high school students continued to increase, as did the Native American students. In 1972, Marlon Johnson was hired to be the director of the UBAVC, it's called the Univasion Area Vocational Center. He served as the director until 1981. And during his administration, a new technology center building was dedicated. We'll see some slides about that later. Here are some of the early faculty members of the Univasion Area Vocational Center. Do you recognize them? That's Say him. <laughs> Anybody rec recognize him? He has a familiar face to me, but I. Malmstrom, yeah. Shorthand. That's why I didn't have any classes from him. I, his. Who's? Clyde Butler. Oh, Clyde Butler, yeah. Of course, Garth was there, so. Mr. Allen? Yeah. Yeah, I still remember. I mean, the faces are real familiar to me. I would have been in high school about that time. Uh, newspaper articles were expounding the tremendous growth in vocational education. They were talking about 173% increases and the adults 38.8% uh, increases. This is just a clip from a 1972 newspaper article. I won't read the whole thing, but you can see it was really catching on. You know, uh, back to USU in 1972, another interesting th thing started to happen. They started flying, as Dad alluded to, uh, flying professors down in some really, actually pretty small uh, planes to teach here at night. And in 1973, well, 74, they were still doing that. I was taking classes at night uh, prior to leaving on my mission. And uh, so I still, I still remember those professors flying in and they would spend uh, longer than normal class time, you know, about a three-hour class, and then they would have some classes on Saturday morning as well. Some of them would all would fly down and teach at night, and then they would they would fly back that same same night over some of the highest mountains in the in Utah. It's pretty dangerous, really. Anyway, the term "fly by night" program was born. <laughs> um, Things were happening at the UVA, UBA VC as well. In 1974, the first nursing class was started. Here's some in, uh, 
interesting things. They said they boasted a salary of $2 an hour, starting salary, tuition of $40, and a textbook cost of $5.50. <laughs> this was kind of an interesting newspaper article that two years later in 1974, and this was giving some statistics about vocational education, not just here, but nationwide. And uh, it says, uh, the public vocational programs raised by 659%. So that the idea of vocational education was catching on, not only here, but across the nation. And if you compare that to this figure, 4% uh, of traditional colleges was all they were growing. We're not growing that fast right now, are we, Bob, Dave? <laughs> it's probably a good thing. <laughs> okay, so this slide kind of represents... Uh, the ground before the vocation, the, the main buildings of the UBATC were built. And then this is an artist's rendering of it. Looks an awful lot like what we have. I won't spend a lot of time on that. This uh, groundbreaking uh, slide, flatbed slide, has been used. I've seen this slide used more than once, not just here, but as I go to uh, some of the other uh, technology colleges, Bridgerland, Dixie, Mountainland, uh, Ogden Weaver, and so forth. They can trace the origins of the technology college uh, centers out to here. And so a lot of them will take this slide <laughs> and show the origins of how things started. It's kind of a classic slide. As this slide indicates, uh, the vocational center, I think if, if I've got the rear, year, year right, it was 1977. I was, uh, I'd been out of the country from 1974 to 1976, so all the time that this was being constructed, it was, um, I wasn't here. Um, the, I think it was fairly newly elected United States Senator, Orrin Hatch, spoke at the dedication. Take a look at his picture. <laughs> and then over at USU, Dr. Varnell Bench was hired in the fall of 1975 as the new director. Dr. Bench hired three additional faculty members in the 1975-76 a year. So now we're up to four. <laughs> Bruce Goodrich, Nels Carlson, Beverly Evans in English, Vince Lafferty in history. Dr. Bench said of the program, I consider it one of the most unique programs in America, a college without buildings and with classes held in two different cities. <laughs> By 1978, the fifth class of practical nurses had graduated from the vocational center. And this was already beginning to have an e effect on the medical services of our local area. It was a great boon to our economy. Any of you recognize some of those people? <laughs> I know this, the picture isn't too good. but One thing I'd say is the, the media out here, the press has always been very favorable to higher education. Whenever anything happened, they covered it very well. Let's see. I'm kind of... Oh yeah, getting my slides out of order here, I think. <laughs> Keith Birdquist, who had previously directed the instruction for the outline areas of the vocational education in Vernal, Manila, and Duchesne, was uh, uh, asked to be the director of instruction at, uh, in 1977. And four years later, he would take over from Marlon Johnson as the center's director. So he, and he was there from 77 through about 1981, I believe. Now this is a picture of uh, Alva Snow. Um, Utah State University Unibasin Extension Center was the first off-campus center 
uh, and was the start of the amazing regional campus and distance education program that we have presently right now. Uh, I would all recommend all, to all of you the reading of John Barton's article concerning this. It's just fantastic reading, to, and he, he presents it much better than I would. But, um, Alva Snow served on the main campus at Logan's Institutional Council from 1963 through 1977, 14 years. And so we were just barely getting started in, you know, we had, we had had a pretty good start. We'd been trying for about 10 years because all this happened from 68 to 1977. And he had a great influence both here and on the Logan campus. And I believe this was a key factor which helped to keep the college going. While he was doing that, as Dad mentioned, he was still in the legislature and served for 12 years, and he was helping to see that the funding at the, at the local level was protected and enhanced. And so funding for the new uh, technology center across the street was, uh, was provided, and ongoing funding for Utah State was was continuing to increase. Rex Tuller was promoted as the Dean of Continuing Education in 1982, and uh, President Snow met with him shortly thereafter and insisted that, as Dean, he should ensure that an actual program be put in place, not random course offerings. At, up until this time, we had had lots of people and people had signed up and taken English courses and courses in this and that, but to really put them into a program where it was structured toward a degree was lacking. And we knew, or he knew, and by that time that we needed to start uh, things uh, toward a degreed program. This is just showing some of the the leadership, David Met, Dave Medlin from 1982 to 86, and then from 1986 to 1996 for a 10 year period, Laird Hartman was the director. Um, Dr. Hartman said of the education center of that time that most Basin residents hardly knew we existed. And we wanted to get parents to be aware that we were there. To do this, we knew we had to get some facilities. And interestingly enough, uh, the, the college was growing at that time, and they were hiring a few new faculty members, but without any kind of a building to call their own, uh, it became very difficult to try to recruit you know, traditional college students. We had a lot of non-traditional students at that time, but the traditional students were still, a few of them would stay, but the majority of them were going away. They started things like Stage Light. I think Alex was <laughs> telling me he was in that. Some other groups that uh, they had uh, athletics, they had rodeo teams. I mean, we were trying everything we could to, to entice students to come here. Let me see. Anyway, by the mid-1980s, a BS degree was available in both elementary and secondary education, and this was a real turning point, I think. A Master's of Education and Administrative Endorsement was also offered. And so what this meant was that people who lived in the basin, who wanted to go into education, who wanted to be school teachers, could get their education and it could happen all right here. And then they could go and become you know, a teacher in our local schools. Up until that time, there was a tremendous amount of turnover in the local uh, schools, Lynn will tell you that. Uh, it, and when people started graduating and getting these degrees from here, it really made a difference to the faculties in our local schools and the economic impact it had as well. <clears throat> By 1988, the only off-campus full-time faculty were located in the Unibasin, and the number had grown to seven. Dave? You recognize? <laughs> <laughs> Dave recognizes that one. <laughs> Karen, yeah. So, 1988. Um, let's see. Where am I at? Okay. Anyway, under the chairmanship of Alva Snow, 
a local facilities committee of sorts was uh, made, uh, and they started to meet, and they, did, they made a proposal before the Utah Impact Board and funds for a headquarters building for the USU Education Center in Roosevelt were asked for. In February of 1988, property west of Union High was purchased for a new building. In May of that year, the Community Impact Board approved funding for the project and bids were let by August 5th. The groundbreaking ceremony was held August 8th. <laughs> the bids led on August 5th, and three days later, the groundbreaking ceremony. Work began immediately. Dedication of the new facility, the one which we are uh, met in tonight, which provided not only office and classroom space and many other amenities, but it finally made the USU Education Center a school with a building. Anyway, the dedication ceremony was held on June 3, 1989. And if you think about that, that was just 30 years after the original legislation was passed to, to, to start a junior college in our area, and roughly t 20 years after the funding for that junior college had been um, granted. I know Dad said that uh, getting on the building board list was going to take decades to get that done. He was right. <laughs> it did take decades. And, uh, and by the way, we didn't go through the building board. <laughs> no. About this time, I was asked to serve on the USU Advisory Board, and I remember many meetings with D Director Hartman, Gordon Snow, Craig Ashby, Dennis Jenkins, Renee Park, and Russ Cowan, and others. The emphasis, uh, the emphasis at this time was to greatly increase our traditional students and make it feel like a real college to them. We were charged with giving and getting others to give scholarship money to help more students want to stay here, and Gordon Snow was the leader in this respect. A great incentive for high, sc Oop, better not turn that. high school students to take concurrent enrollment classes at USU, Unibasin campus, was made when a change was made in 1990 by the Board of Regents to allow associate's degrees to be earned in the basin. And soon, uh, they allowed them to be earned uh, in other areas of the state as well, specifically Brigham City, Tooele. By this time, the word had, branch had been dropped from the name as well. They used to call it the Unibasin Branch Campus. Uh, John Barton, in his article, says they lopped off the branches. <laughs> <laughs> because a number of the... Uh, Unibasin residents who were able to get Bachelor of Science and Master's of Science degrees in education. They were able to secure positions as teachers in the local schools and turnover rates, as I said earlier, dropped quickly in our local schools. Another uh, fortunate uh, thing happened in 1993. Um, First Security Bank Corporation had bought out Walker Bank and there was a building left vacant on adjacent property to the USU property here in Roosevelt. I know my father at the time uh, went and visited with Vern Osmond, who was the head of the bank, and then they uh, went to their superiors at, at the state level and uh, were able to, uh, with a very generous donation, I think the bank's donation part of it was about $350,000 for the building and property and so forth. And then the uh, college uh, put in an additional $50,000 and a, the building, which is now the administration building, was purchased. With the addition of the bank building, it was a desire to have better signage for the local campuses. Now that we had some uh, Highway 40 footage, it was uh, important to try to have some signage. And um, I think I've got a picture of that. My son Nicholas is here tonight. He'll remember this. <laughs> That's his Eagle Scout project right there, putting in the flagpole. USU expansion. As more courses and degrees were offered, USU Unibasin Branch campus administrators and community members began making plans to handle the growing enrollment. In February of 1998, the Duchesne County Higher Education Committee, as they were called, which had been formed four years early previously, 
successfully lobbied the legislature for a $2 million grant. Members of that committee uh, were headed by Craig Ashby and were Gordon Snow, Dave Labrum, Brad Hancock, Larry Ross, and other elected city and county officials. I'm, not sh I'm sure I'm not mentioning all of them, but they met very often and worked hard to see that another building was built in, for USU and Roosevelt. The Community Impact Board assisted in the effort with another $2 million grant and a $500,000 loan. Duchesne County, Moon Lake Electric Association, the Uinta Basin Medical Center, and the Uinta Basin Telecommunication Association, now called Strata Networks, contributed a total of $350,000 in cash to the project. Duchesne County and Roosevelt City also contributed $300,000 of in-kind labor and property for the project. After years of planning and a lot of perseverance, uh, $4.85 million was secured for the construction out of a 34,000 square foot addition. Architects and planning began for the new building. It would include a student union area, 10 offices for professors, a 40,000 square, 4,000 square foot, foot online library, a competition sized gymnasium, a large tiered classroom, four receiving uh, studios, classrooms for Ednet and satellite links and two broadcast studios. It's interesting to me to think of the forward thinking of our communication people as well. And distance education had started, you know, right from the beginning, uh, teaching online, and they used, you know, what technology was available then. But that technology had increased uh, so much and has over the next 10 to 20 years to where now um, we are the, the rival of the nation in our regional campuses and distance education technology here in, in associated with Utah State University. Uh, Guy Denton was named as the director in September of 1990 and was to lead the USU campus into the new millennium. I remember uh, meeting with Dr. Hartman many times in our meetings and as well as Dr. Denton. Um, Dr. Hartman was promoted to a new position on the Logan campus. Anyway, groundbreaking ceremonies were to be held Tuesday, October 19th and it was finished in time. Uh, for the November 2000 winter quarter, and has since affectionately taken on the name The Barn. Uh, my personal focus somewhat shifted in the mid-1990s when I was asked to be the USU Advisory Board's representative on the governing board of the Vocational Center. And uh, I have served with all of these presidents since that time Mark Rose uh, was there when the technology, the new technology wing were for nursing and so forth was added. Lynn, you could probably tell us more about that era. I remember uh, Richard Jones, uh, mostly working with him. At this same time, uh, uh, the legislature passed a bill and took all of the vocational centers throughout the state, all eight of them, and made them into one entity called the Utah College of Applied Technology. And it was uh, Richard Jones's responsibility to now start to integrate with the rest of the state. Up until that time, you know, they, they had meetings with the presidents, but they were really not together as one entity. And so it was his responsibility to um, go through that transition uh, we had Shane Larson for a very short time. He was uh, a native to the basin, was hired to come here. He'd been in Spain and um, started working as our new camp. By this time, they had called him presidents. And uh, he was unfortunately killed in a terrible automobile accident on his way out to a meeting uh, in the Strawberry Valley. I'll just say a little bit about Paul Hacking. I've worked with Paul uh, for for many years on the board. Paul will probably be remembered in history for what he did to, uh, in bringing the Vernal campus to Vernal, Utah. But I would just like to say that he also uh, was very instrumental in upgrading the facilities here in Roosevelt as well. Um, a lot of uh, upgrading to the facilities 
and the growth. And then also, you know, being new to UCAT, uh, he, he fit in very well right there. Mark Walker was here for a short time, and due to family issues, he had to depart, and we just recently hired Dave Wilsonhume. And I think Dave is going to be a great fit uh, because of his association with Utah State University. And as you can see through this presentation, from the very beginning, these two colleges, their schools, started out together. They, they kind of served two different missions and two different maybe types of students. But they've both grown and there's never been, uh, you know, really any animosity between them. They've worked very well together. I guess I'll, that's enough to say about that. This is just a shot of the, I, could, I got one picture of the construction of that technology wing. And I've already talked about this, um, that uh, the UCAT was born in 2001. And we've been, uh, what, 12 years since then? So it was at that same time that Dixie, uh, the college at Dixie was started and broke off from Dixie College itself. And right now we have eight uh, campuses throughout the state. But it's really interesting as I go to, the, I'm a member of the Board of Trustees on that right now, and as you go to these meetings, so many of them want to hear about the history of, <laughs> of how UCAT and you started, and it all started right here in Roosevelt, Utah. Okay, I think I have. This is just some of the recent USU leadership uh, through the present time. Well, uh, just one thing uh, away from colleges. We've talked about colleges for quite a while, but uh, also here in Roosevelt, uh, the junior high that I attended was torn down, as we all know, and a new junior high was built in the... Does anybody know when it was dedicated? I'm thinking in the, the about year was 2006, 2006. So they moved in 2006. 2006? Yeah, about 2006. I think that was the same year we built our new clinic down there. I was thinking it was about the same time. And, uh, you know, this was a much needed facility. Um, wait, right now we have a new high school in the planning stages. And I guess I just pose the question, well, what will learning be like in the 22nd century? Will it be more remote and online? Will it fall into nice seven-hour blocks, or will it be broken up and offered 24 hours a day? Um, what, I just have one more slide to kind of, or not a slide, but a, just a little video clip to show what the impact that these two institutions have had on one family in the basin. And this is a video clip I'll, I'll show of one of our board members, Robert Foley. I took this from a little talk that he gave at the dedication of the Vernal Building over there. And, uh, but I just wanted to show how that had impacted his family, and I'll just kind of close with that. Personal matter for me. In 1967, and if you count back, that's about 40 years ago, what uh, Provost Coward mentioned. I was a senior at UNA High School, and I noted an announcement that Utah State University was offering a freshman English class. Now, that may have been the first class they offered out here. It was certainly one of the first. It was. <laughs> I registered for the class and another one the following quarter, and that head start helped me receive my bachelor's degree in three years plus a summer semester. Over the years, my family's benefited greatly from the opportunities for advanced education here at home. My son attended UBATC and received certificates of completion in the business program. He subsequently attended Utah State University here and received a bachelor's degree in business. One of our daughters completed her degree in elementary education, all here at home. Another daughter took many of her classes locally and completed her math degree with only three semesters at Logan. I received my master's degree from Utah State University without attending a single class in Logan. My wife completed both her master's and doctorate degrees in education through distance programs offered here in the basin. 
we know firsthand the benefits of both vocational and higher education and have been greatly blessed by the opportunities that are here in the Univasion. I really think that says it all. You consider that times a uh, hundred other families of, of similar experience. It was interesting to me to look through a lot of the old photos. I didn't have time to put them all on the, the slideshow, but just to see one that stands out in my mind was a, an old newspaper clipping and it showed one of the very first English classes and it showed the students in the class. And you could look at those students and just like Dad said, they were, <laughs> they were all the way from 60, 70 years of age down to high school age, all different ages. Um, the ba Roosevelt has been home to some great education. We've seen a lot of changes in our lifetime. As I think back of my earliest memories, walking across that field where nothing <laughs> stood between the end of Third North and the Toyak building and that old high school and to see all of the improvements up in that part of our town, to see the new junior high school and then all of the education facilities and buildings, uh, it's, it's amazing. But I really believe the heroes in all of this are the students. For without, for without their willingness to take a chance on this education here, none of this would have happened. So I take my hat off to the students, and uh, thank you. Good night. You into Basin special events coverage on VTV6 and Strata Web View is made possible by Century 21 Parker Real Estate Professionals. The Porch Southern Cuisine, Uinta Basin Healthcare, and Wind River Wireless.